Did you know that in some insect species, almost no one gets to mate? Yeah, so species like honeybees, ants, or termites, more than 99% of individuals spend their entire lives sterile. Only a small fraction of the group, typically a single queen, or perhaps a handful of reproductive males, do all the mating. At first glance, this arrangement seems to run completely counter to the logic of evolution by natural selection. After all, if natural selection favors traits that increase reproductive success of individuals, how could it be that the vast majority of individuals in these circumstances have apparently given up their chance to reproduce? In this video, we start to unpack this little puzzle, examining the genetic and ecological explanations for how you social insects can thrive when so few of them ever mate at all. Large organized insect societies take many forms, but they share a key trait. A select few individuals reproduce, while the rest act as helpers or defenders. In a typical honeybee hive like Apis mellifera, a single queen lays all the eggs, and tens of thousands of sterile workers gather nectar, produce wax comb, feed the brood, and defend the colony. There's a few male drones that exist just to mate with the queen on her very first mating flight and then they die shortly after. She stores all the sperm and never needs to mate again. Ant colonies parallel this system, but often have more specialized castes, like soldiers with enlarged heads and powerful jaws for defense, or oversized super soldiers, or different types of worker morphs. Despite these structural differences, the reproductive focus remains on one or a few queens, plus occasional reproductive males that briefly appear for mating. Most ants you see scurrying about on the ground or exploring your kitchen are sterile workers. Termites take a slightly different route, with both a king and a queen permanently residing within a colony. Together, they produce thousands or tens of thousands of offspring. Instead of forming their own colony, these offspring stay in the mound where they were hatched to become sterile workers or soldiers. They construct elaborate nests, gather or process food like wood and leaf litter, and stand guard at the nest entrance. In these types of scenarios, one basic question looms. How is it evolutionarily viable for nearly every individual to stay sterile while only a tiny fraction are permitted to reproduce. In the early 1960s, William Hamilton, a young British evolutionary biologist, was grappling with this problem. How a sterile worker insects in large cooperative colonies could possibly be favored by natural selection. He noted that many of these eusocial species tended to be haplodiploid. This means that the females have two sets of chromosomes. They're diploid. But the males only have one set of chromosomes. They're haploid. In these systems, females hatch from fertilized eggs, whereas males hatch from unfertilized eggs. So, if a queen mates only once, two sisters can share up to 75% of their genes, rather than the typical 50% that you would see with diploid species. This is because they share 50% of the genetic material they get from their diploid mother, the queen, but they share 100% of the genetic material they get from their haploid father. So from a mathematical standpoint, if you assume that sterile sisters share 75% of their genetic material, then helping to raise additional sisters could yield a bigger payoff in terms of passing on shared genes as compared to the alternative of having your own offspring. Hamilton expressed this logic in the equation R times B should be greater than C, where R is the degree of relatedness between the helper and the beneficiary, and B is essentially the number of relatives that are helped. 
C would be the cost in missed reproductive opportunities. So imagine if honeybees were diploid and a worker could leave the hive to rear, say, 100 offspring, each of those offspring sharing 50% of her genes. So that would be 50 total gene copies. In a haploid diploid system, however, she would forfeit that 50 copies. So C would be 50. But if she helped to raise 100 sisters, each sharing roughly 75% of her genes, that would give her an R times B of 0.75 times 100, 75. So she would benefit 75 gene copies. Because 75 exceeds the cost of 50, she would gain more genetic success by remaining in the colony. And even though brothers would still only share about 50% of her genetic material, they occur less frequently. So her main payoff comes through her sisters. Hamilton's rule helps to demonstrate how altruism can be adaptive and beneficial despite workers foregoing the opportunity to reproduce on their own. Now, this seems to work really well for haploid diploid species like bees and ants, where the relatedness between siblings is high. But then you have species like termites, for instance, that are fully diploid, but just as social. And here's the other kicker. Not all haploid diploid species are eusocial either. It's really only a small percentage. So while Hamilton's rule might help explain some of the benefit of kin selection, and use social behavior in some instances, it kind of falls short of being a universal rule that can be applied across the board. So what else could explain use social behavior? And in particular, sterile castes of workers in diploid species like termites. Well, in the 1990s, an American ecologist named Barbara Thorne proposed that, well, it's probably lots of things. Her work indicated that multiple ecological and life history traits likely stack up to make cooperative, permanently non-reproductive helpers beneficial. If we look at termites, first, early termites likely occupied well-defended, food-rich habitats like rotting logs, where founding queens and kings could remain for many reproductive cycles. This stable, protected nest meant that staying put and assisting relatives often beat the risks of dispersing alone. Next, termites undergo hemimetabolous development. This means that their juveniles, called nymphs, look like smaller versions of the adults and gain adult traits gradually with each molt, so they don't have a distinct pupil stage. So these immature nymphs are functional in the nest. They can help with tasks rather than just waiting to pupate. Each generation can thus start sharing brood care and foraging duties. Monogamy in the founding pair further supports cooperation since overlapping generations of siblings have enough genetic incentive to help one another. While those relatedness levels may not match the hymenopteran haploid diploid of 75%, they're still high enough for altruism to pay off when you factor in safe nesting and continuous brood care. Some of Thorne's support for this multi-factor view came from comparing termite species with their closest cockroach relatives, the Cryptocircus. Some wood roaches show extended family associations and transfer symbiotic microbes to their offspring, but they lack the full suite of traits like prolonged nest defense and overlapping broods and strict monogamy that seem to push termites all the way to the point where a sterile cast is adaptive. But taken together, these findings suggest that eusocial behavior in diploid species like termites arises through a synergy of factors. There's no single hypothesis, whether it's about inbreeding or sibling-sibling relatedness, that explains why termites commit so heavily to non-reproductive roles. In the end, the apparent paradox of eusocial colonies in which most members remain sterile still fits into an evolutionary or natural selection type of logic. Once we consider both the gene level processes like kin selection and inclusive fitness, along with the synergy of multiple other factors like safe nesting sites, 
extended brood care, monogamy, and overlapping generations. They all work in concert to favor large social family groups. Genes still spread, just indirectly or cooperatively, and colonies gain major survival advantages when everyone is working together. It's the power of the many. Well, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.